And uh, we're going to come back to that because we're going to see something else amazing that happens here. So let's go now to uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. Now what happens is, uh, we'll, I'll mention this a little bit later on, but uh, he has just been commanded to go to the brook chair. And he's going to drink the water from the brook. And the Lord's going to command the ravens to come and, and uh, to, uh, to bring food to him. Now, I don't know whether, do we have ravens here? Yes. And, all right, so you all know about ravens. And uh, you've seen them, and uh, you know about them. And uh, there's a lot of things about ravens we can say. One thing I want to say about them is they're pretty smart. Uh, I've seen ravens uh, trick a dog out of his food. I've seen them do some amazing things. I don't think there's a bird in the whole wide world can fly like a raven can fly. You ever see them fly upside down? They'll be flying along. Maybe they've got something that another raven wants or something. Ravens are chasing him. He'll just turn upside down and fly upside down a while. Trying to get away. And they're an amazing bird. But, according to the scriptures, they're an unclean bird. And uh, one of the things that, you'll, that, that I've seen ravens do is, we got a lot of ravens in the north. I mean, really lots of them. Hundreds and hundreds of them. And uh, sometimes, you know, in the middle of winter, when times get kind of tough, I mean, the dump gets snowed over, you know, and they can't get to their food, and they've already picked up all the garbage around town and everything. I've seen them sitting down at the sewage lagoon, where the sewer comes out, just sitting there, and, yeah. you know, time and time again. And uh, I really realize that a raven eat anything. And, uh, but they, somehow they survived. But the amazing thing about this story is that God commands the ravens and they actually carry food to Elijah and give it up to him instead of eating it themselves. Now that's an amazing thing for a raven to give up food. <laughs> but anyway, that's what happens. And so we're going to pick this up in verse 8 because what takes place is that the brook dries up that Elijah's drinking from. It just dries up. There's no more water there. So he has to do something else. And verse 8 says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. And I watch this word. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, I want to point out something that we'll miss if I don't bring it out here is that he had commanded the widow woman. So she knew that Elijah was coming. She didn't, I don't think she knew who he was. I think that in this day, because by the time the New Testament tells us uh, that there was three and a half years that this, uh, this drought was going to be, three and a half years long. And so uh, I think that probably there were a lot of bums in that day. Mm -hmm. Now remember, by this time, it's several years into, into this situation, Elijah's been camping out by a creek. For a, for a while now, and I submit to you, he probably looked like a bum. And so she didn't know who this was that was going to come. You know, she didn't know which one of the bums is, is the, the man of God that uh, the Lord has commanded me to sustain. And so we read along, we continue to read along there. It says, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain me. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow woman was there gathering of sticks. Let me say to you as well that God tells him to go over there and find this widow woman, but he didn't know what she's like either. He didn't know what she looks like. And I can submit to you that there might have been, as a matter of fact, the New Testament says that in Israel in that day there were many widows. Now this is outside the borders of Israel, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But the point is that he had no idea who she was. She had no idea who he was. And so this was going to take something that the Lord was going to have to put together. And so it says, So he arose and went to Zarephath. And uh, when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now remember, there's a drought on and He's asking for water to start with. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. In other words, 
And we eat that, there's nothing else. There's no hope of any more food. We're just going to eat it, and that's the end. We're close to starvation anyway, and that'll be the last meal that we'll have. Verse 13 says, And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, but go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first. I want to submit to you that Elijah was a Baptist preacher. Who else but a Baptist preacher would take a widow woman's last meal? But, but he did. And uh, so he says, go make me a little cake first. Now I've got that word first circle because if you go over to the uh, Second Corinthians chapter 8 where we were at this morning, that the word first is actually mentioned two different times. And it's, uh, the idea there is that they gave themselves first. They gave of themselves, not just what they had, but they gave of themselves. I learned a long time ago in pastoring and, and teaching people uh, to give that uh, if, you know, if you can get a, a person, a man or a woman or a teenager or whatever, if you can get a person to give themselves, you don't have to worry about the rest of it. And when they give themselves, if you can get them to give themselves, they'll give, they'll give what they have. And here she was, uh, he is, uh, uh, we see that in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 8, that they first gave themselves. And then a little bit later on the word first occurs again. But anyway, make me a little cake first. Now watch this, verse 13. And bring it unto me, and after, make for thee and for thy son. And uh, right there, I can just almost imagine that she's saying, she's probably thinking, maybe she didn't say it, but she's probably thinking, uh, uh, big boy, maybe you didn't hear me, but I said there's enough meal and there's enough oil for us to make one small meal, and that's it. And now you're telling me to make you a cake first, and then after that, to make for me and my son. Hello, there isn't enough to make up for me and my son if I give it to you. But notice here what happens. And it says then in verse 14, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste. In other words, the barrel of meal is never going to run, run empty. And uh, not only that, neither shall the cruise of oil fail. That is, the cruise of oil is never going to go dry. It says, Until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And I want you to notice this morning, or this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, that when the Lord supplies, He is able to supply until the crisis is over. Amen. And, uh, you know, the grace that is going to, uh, if, if we live, and I believe we will, I believe that the very next event on God's calendar of events is going to be the rapture. I mean, the trumpet's going to sound. Amen. The Amen. Lord's going to come as far as the clouds. Amen. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. And the Lord is able to sustain us by, through His grace and through His mercy, through His supply, He's able to take care of us and look, look, look to us until that time when the crisis is over. And so that's what, he, that's what the promise here was, that uh, until, the, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth, the barrel isn't going to waste and the cruise isn't going to fail. Verse 15, now remember when we said that Elijah went and did? Now watch this. And she went and did. Amen. Amen. I like that. Yeah. Not only do we need some preachers and some pastors and some evangelists and some missionaries that went and did, but we need some church members that went and did. Amen. 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 I mean, we need some people that are just maybe some widow people, maybe some uh, some uh, some widowers, uh, maybe some single moms, uh, just the ordinary working people, some farmers, some miners, whatever it is, some fishermen, that will just went and did what Amen. God told them to do. Amen. And uh, boy, I like this, that this, uh, this idea of went and did. I want to be a guy that was known as a fellow that went and did. Amen. And uh, so we see that here. The Bible says, and she, now watch this, and so Elijah went and did according to the saying of the Lord, or, I mean, she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she, and he, and her house did eat many days. Uh, and the, it says, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Now the picture that I get of this is that when Elijah sends her over there to, to, to make the cake, that uh, he, she goes over there to her barrel and she reaches in there with her her little whatever it is, her wooden spoon or whatever, she's going to get that uh, meal out of there, that flour or whatever, corn meal, whatever it would be. 
and uh, wouldn't be like cornmeal like we have. Because corn, when you read in the Bible in the Old Testament, corn is not corn like we have here that grows in eight, seven, and eight foot high stalks. It was. It means it was wheat. It was grain. Okay. Corn is a, a kind of a. a it's a North American thing. They didn't know of that kind of corn. So she had some kind of meal in this barrel. And she'd go over there. And when, when he sent her over there for that first thing to make him a cake first, she probably looked in that. She may have shook her head. And she just figured there's enough in there for him, but there ain't enough in there for us. And so she took her thing and, and she started to get it in there. And she's digging around and she's getting that stuff. And sure enough, she comes up with enough stuff to make one cake. And she goes off and she cooks it and she brings it to him. But she remembered what he said, that after that you go and make for you and your son. And she goes back over there and she just knows there isn't going to be enough in there. But she looks in there and she does see a few remnants in there. And so she starts to do that again. And you know what God, you know what God in heaven heard that. And God in heaven came down and he supplied that. And from that day forward, every time she comes that barrel, and she around in that barrel, scraped that barrel, God in heaven heard that she had a need. And he, and he understood and he knew that here was a woman that went and did according to the words of Elijah. Amen. And what we need to understand is if we could just fall into that same pattern and begin to get God to look after us in the same way, we'll go a long way towards being able to be pleasing to the Lord in this matter of faith, promise, mission. Amen. Now look at your outline there, if you would, please. Now that we've said all that, let's just look at some background information. You probably know all about this, but I'm just going to run this by you. Uh, beginning, but you notice there, number one, I'm talking about the divided kingdom. And what that is about is, if you remember that um, uh, when, uh, if you go chronologically through your Bible, you come to the place where God was, uh, governing the nation, his, his people, by what we call a theocracy. It was directly from God to the people through his prophets. And they went through a period of time. Remember then there was a book called the Book of Judges? And there was a time when God used the judges to, uh, to help and to deliver them, to judge the people and so forth. And they went all through that. But there came a time when the, when the people of God, the, 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 uh, the Hebrew people, they became dissatisfied with this theocracy. And they started looking around and they saw, hey, all these kingdoms around us, all these people around us that live around us here, they all have a king. And we think it would be a good idea if, if God give us a king too. And they griped and they moaned and they complained about that until finally, I think it was some kind of secondary will of God. I'm not sure what that is, but I think they were a little bit out of God's will. And finally God said, all right, you want a king? I'll give you a king. You're not going to like it, but I'll give you a king. He's going to constrict your... Uh, can, can strip your, your, your sons. Uh, he's going to uh, uh, draft them into the, into the army. He's going to take your, your, your young women and he's going to take them into the, uh, uh, into the palace and he's, they're going to become servants. And You want a king? All right, you'll have a king. We remember that there were actually three kings under, under the, under the uh, combined, king, uh, combined kingdoms in the beginning. There was King Saul, you remember, and then there was King David, and then there was his son, King Solomon. And we'll cut to the chase here, but when King Solomon died, a power struggle erupted. And the power struggle was so fierce that the kingdom itself divided. The northern kingdom went with a, 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 with a son of, uh, of Solomon by the name of Jeroboam, who actually at the time was in exile in, in Egypt, as I recall. And another son, actually half-brothers, a fellow by the name of Rehoboam became king of the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom was called Judah because it was primarily made up of the tribe of Judah, although there was Benjamin and I forget who else was down there. But anyway, the northern kingdom became known as Israel. And so when you read in your Bible, you're, uh, in, you know, concerning the, in the Old Testament, after the book, uh, you know, when, when uh, uh, Samuel and, and those guys, you get the kings and so forth, Sometimes that seems confusing because you don't know whether he's talking about the northern kingdom Israel or the southern kingdom Judah. And you've got to figure out that. But I want you to notice that the north, by the way, Israel, the northern kingdom, later became known as Samaria by the time of, uh, Jesus was, was alive. Known as Samaria. But as all of that 
battles happening, the northern kingdom never had a good king. They started off with Jeroboam, you know, a bad guy, and they just continued to get, uh, continued to go downhill after that. But anyway, uh, in, into this situation, there comes a king and a queen by the name of Ahab and Jezebel. And Ahab and Jezebel were, were on the throne at the time of Elijah when all of this is happening. And so the, the kingdom was divided, and we see that the number two, then the wicked leadership of Ahab and Jezebel, and that the, uh, the New Testament tells us that the drought was three and a half years long, and we also notice that Elijah was a hunted man. I know they didn't have telephone poles in that day, but if they had had, you could, you could be absolutely certain there was a wanted poster for Prophet Elijah on every telephone pole and throughout that, throughout that, and he was hunted. Why? Because Ahab, in his stupidity and in, in, in his spiritual ignorance, thought that all of this problem, this drought and everything, this was all Elijah's problem. Well, it wasn't Elijah's problem. It was God that had a problem with, with Israel, not just Elijah. And so uh, we, we come down through there. He's a, he's a wanted man, a hunted man. And we see that Elijah by the brook chair being fed, fed by the ravens. And finally, the chair dries up. And he is called to an unlikely city. And here it says that, his, that this city was called Zarephath. In the New Testament, in Luke chapter 4, and verse 25, the, uh, the, the, it, it is referred to as Sep, uh, uh, Sarepta. And it is, outside of Israel, it is a Phoenician town. Now, what that means is, it was a Gentile city. It was outside of Israel. We're not talking about God's chosen people, the Hebrew children anymore. We're talking about Gentile people. And we also see that it's not only an unlikely city, but he's called to an unlikely woman. She is a Gentile, and on top of that, she's a widow woman. And uh, then we see that she is living in an unlikely situation in order to be able to sustain him. What the, what the Lord said was, you go over to Zarephath because I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. She was an unlikely woman. She was a Gentile. She was a, a widow, but she didn't have anything. I mean, she's down to her last meal. Do we understand that? She has nothing past this handful of meal here and a little bit of oil to cook with. And so, uh, it, it, you know, an unlikely situation. And let me, that brings us to point number one. You want to get your pen out and fill in this blank here as we go then. Uh, we see that her situation was dire. Her situation was dire. And by that we mean that her supply was limited. Uh, she had just a handful of meal, a little bit of oil, and number two, she had no hope of further relief. Now understand with me that in the, the, that in the day and age in which you and I live, that we've got some social programs uh, here in Canada that it's almost impossible to starve to death. I mean, you know, you can always go to, you can go to social services, you can approach welfare people, or whatever, and you can, uh, you can come up with some money for some food. Down where I don't know where they have them here, but down in the state where I grew up, there were food stands. And I remember that uh, one time I was in line checking out, and this guy in front of me had food stands. He was paying for his, for, for his food with food stands that he got from welfare. And uh, he had a, he, he had a, they had carnations that they were selling that day. And he had a carnation there. And the girl checking him out said, you can't have that carnation. You can't pay for that with food stamps. This is only for food. And he went and ate an awful of carnation. She rang it up and it went through. What I'm simply saying is that, that there, there's, there's ways, you know, but you, uh, they didn't have that in that day. There were no social programs in that era. There wasn't anybody to appeal to. There wasn't anybody to go to. And so poor people were susceptible. But listen to me, widow women, widow women were the ultimate in susceptibility. There was nobody to go to. She had no relatives. She had no husband. And all she had was a son who apparently was an underage uh, juvenile and uh, apparently unable to supply her with, uh, with any kind of food. And so her situation was dire. And uh, secondly, we see uh, letter B then, that her circumstance required faith. And uh, as we already said, Elijah comes to her in the middle of a drought and says, fetch me a little water to drink. And she must have looked at him like, are you crazy? You know, don't you realize how long it's been since it's rained? 
of uh, my well is dry. All the wells were dried up. The creeks were dried up. There wasn't any water to be had. It was very scarce. As a matter of fact, one of the things later on, when Elijah gets there on Mount Carmel and he douses down the sacrifice, and he sacrificed with 12 barrels of water, four barrels at a time, did three times. That must have been a huge expense in water. And it must have looked like the un to the unspiritual eyes that that was an awful waste. Now, I can tell you something. You're going to look around and when your relatives find out that you're giving to, 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 to tithe and you're giving to missions, they're going to think that what you're doing is a terrible waste. Why are you doing that? You need to keep that money yourself. You need to look after yourself. You need to this. You need to that. And if you're not careful, their argument is going to sound very plausible to you after a while. But what we've got to do is we've got to understand that, listen, we don't march to the beat of the same drummer that, that the world marches to. Amen. We're different. The Bible says we're a peculiar people. That doesn't mean that we're weird, although we're considered weird, aren't we, by, uh, by, by the unsaved crowd. How many times have you, been, have you uh, surmised that your relatives think that you're just loony to them? Something happened. Something snapped in there and have gone crazy. And uh, I had, you know, I was like that when I first got saved. I remember that um, one time in this preaching service, I got into conviction. I remember it wasn't that the, 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 the preaching was not about evangelism and soul winning. But I was under conviction, and I told my wife, I leaned over and I said, you take uh, our daughter, who's just, just a newborn babe, and I said, you take uh, Jody and you go down. Uh, to the preacher's house after church. I've got something I've got to go do. I'll, when I get finished, I'll come down and pick you up. It'll be after church. And I went off to my relatives, took a couple of cousins of mine to witness. And uh, one of them was uh, a Roman Catholic background. And uh, because of this, my aunt, she had married into the Forney family, and she was a Catholic background. And that's the way she raised her kids. You know, in the Catholic church, if you do it the way they want you to, uh, if you marry a Catholic, he either joins the Catholic Church or comes with you, or at the very least, you have to promise to raise your children Roman Catholic, and she'd done that. So here I am knocking on her door and trying to witness to her, to my cousin about Christ. And she trusted the Lord as her Savior, got born again that night, and I said, Now you be sure to tell your mom and dad about this when they get home. Well, she did. And Aunt Irene called Grandma, and Grandma called Dad, and Dad called me. And I said that this was the next morning, this was Monday morning before I went to work. I mean, the phone lines must have been buzzing, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, and I said to Dad, I said, well, what did you, what did you tell, Aunt, uh, tell Grandma to tell Aunt Irene? And he said, I told them that this, this religion stuff is kind of, you just got into this and you're kind of, uh, kind of radical about it, but give him time, he'll get over it. Well, guess what? I never got over it. Amen. I probably got a little worse. Amen. But your family's going to think you're crazy. They're going to think you're looney to you flipped out. Space cadet stuff, you know. They're going to just mark it down. That's the way it is. And so we look at this woman's life, and we would, the, 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 if you leave God out of this equation, this was stupid what she did. Gave away her last meal. But there's a point here. The point is, that her circumstances that she was going to get. Listen, all she had to look forward to was eat one more meal and then die in the home. But God had a purpose and a plan for her. Now you watch this because this is really, man, this excites me. Because her circumstances required faith. And look at what he said there in verse 13. Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake, what? For now he didn't say, go and make for your son and, uh, and yourself and eat. And then we'll have a prayer meeting and we'll see if God will put some more flour in that barrel. That isn't what he said. No. He said, you go and make a little cake first for me. Now we think that that's kind of, uh, kind of uh, chauvinistic or kind of uh, assuming on his part. And we could attach all kind of adjectives to that thing to, you know, to, to make it make it something other than what it is. But the fact of the matter is that God here is requiring her, if she's going to get out of this situation and live to see the, the, you know, the, uh, the, the end of this famine or this drought, she's going to have to exercise some faith. And the faith part of it was just went and did. And I like it because she just went and did. Even though it may not have made sense to her, she went and did. 
Now, when I preach Faith Promise Mission Conferences, and we're explaining all of this, there's always an element in the church that is skeptical. And I actually preached this up in, um, I'm thinking Timmins, Ontario, but it was Tapas Casey, uh, Ontario, at a church there. And uh, one of the guys that didn't want to do this, he obviously didn't want to do it, uh, he made some comment about uh, that this was a, a, a new angle on getting money out of people that don't want to give it. And I heard about that before the meeting was over, and I said that, I said this to them, and I'm going to say it to you. If you don't want to get involved in this, then don't. This is something you have to want to be involved in. Amen. It's, Amen. This is something you have to want to do. You say, why so? Because if, if I put the pressure on you and convince you as it were against your will, and you just do it because you're ashamed not to, somewhere through, through the year, probably won't be too far into the year, you're going to quit. Why? Because you didn't want to do it. And so the point is that if we, you know, if we, if we want in on this, it's got to be because we want to. Amen. If you don't want to, then don't. God will still love you. You can still come to church here. We're not going to kick you out if you don't. But I'm just telling you that if you want God's best for your life, that you'll uh, consider what I'm saying here. So uh, he said, make me a little cake first. And then, uh, let us see there, fill this in, that her response to what he said, she, she exercised faith, and her response in acting of faith, that is she went and she made the cake and gave it to Elijah, it triggered God's supply. And that's a key note there. What she did, her acting in faith, triggered God's supply. Now, do you remember this morning that I said the idea of the faith promise principle is all of faith? And you remember how that I took you back and I said we're saved by faith? Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. Let's go back to that point in our lives. I want each one of you right now to go back to that place in your life where you were lost and God was dealing with you about your condition, about dying and going to hell. And you got concerned about your relationship with God. And you understood that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And that His blood, as it were, were carried into the presence of God. And there on the Holy of Holies, on the mercy seat, Christ poured out His blood. And we say it this way, the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, wording that we use, the theological wording is, we say that God was propitiated. And what that word means is, it means that God was satisfied with the offering. He looked at the blood of Christ, and pardon, I mean, uh, I mean no, ir no, 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 no irrespect to the Lord and to the blood, but he looked at it and he said, that'll work. Amen? Amen? And God, the Heavenly Father, accepted the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, because Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world, let me give you another quiz. That means then that everybody is going to be saved. No? No? What is what what salvation is dependent as far as we're concerned upon two things, and I'll give them to you here, you fill in the blanks. It is conditioned on repentance and faith. I turn from my sin. Let me just give you a little theological definition here. Okay, can I take this off? Hot in here. Yes. Oh, I turn the thing. <coughs> we you know. We get all bent out of shape about this idea of repentance. And some people say, well, repentance isn't necessary to be saved. Jesus said, except you repent, you all likewise perish. Of course it's, of course it's necessary. Hello? Amen. But it's not what some people think. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for our sin. That's right. It's turning from it. Amen. And so here I am. I'm going down my life at the age of 19. I'm going down through life and I'm going my direction. And my life is, 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 is laden with sin. I'm unpleasing to the Lord. I'm committing things that are, 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 are atrocities as far as God is concerned. And the Spirit of God convicts me. And I see I need to be saved. And I turn to God. Hello? Mm -hmm. In turning to God, that in aviation when I learned to fly, they said if you fly in bad weather, the best thing to do is make 180 and get out of there. <laughs> And so here I am, I'm in trouble, I'm going into, I'm heading, I'm already in trouble, but it's going to get worse, hello? Yeah. It's going to end up in an eternal fire for me, hello? Yeah. 
Right. And so I turn from that, and in turning to God, I'm turning away from that. And if that's really your life, you're exercising that. That listen, you say, well, what? Somebody said to me one day, or heard me talking about this, and they said, well, which comes first, repentance or faith? And I said, it's, they're the opposite sides of the same coin. On one coin is heads, and the other side is tails. On one side of the salvation coin is repentance. On the other side is faith. When you exercise, it, listen. What is it that kicks God's saving grace into, into gear for me? It's faith. Amen. Everything I do now that I'm saved is to be by faith. I'm to walk in faith. Amen? Amen. And when I said this morning that we give in faith, are you starting to picture this? Amen. A widow woman scrapes in there. <laughs> and she, she gets enough out and she makes a cake. And in faith, she gives it to Elijah. She heard the promise... But she hasn't collected on it yet. Hello? You with me? Yeah. And she's going to have to exercise faith and give, to give it to him that God's going to do what he said he would do. Mm -hmm. And what it did was, when she exercised that faith, look at your outline there, it triggered God's supply. Listen, faith always triggers God's supply. doesn't matter whether he's supplying salvation. It doesn't matter whether he's supplying grace for my life to change to get through. Sometimes it requires grace to live with the people God's put me with. Sometimes it requires grace for the people I have to work with. Whatever it is, what always triggers God's supply is faith. Always, always, always. It's faith. Amen. Amen. And then we see the next thing here is Dean will close with this. Well, don't get excited when I say I close. I always close five or six times every message. It's the best part. That's why I do it so much. Amen. But notice there, Dean, she saw astounding results. First of all, God, uh, let, let's notice something that the preacher was supplied. Look at verse 15. It says that she went and did, according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he, let's just stop there, he did eat many days. Now Elijah has to stay alive. He's got a lot of work to do yet. He's studying the life of Elijah, and he's got a lot of stuff God, God, he's got to carry on with, and God's going to use him in a great way. But he can't do that if he dies of starvation. And so God here is using a widow woman with her meager means. The poorest of the poor. Hey, is this starting to resonate with you about something we said this morning about the churches in Macedonia? Mm -hmm. They weren't just poor. They were very poor. And yet God, through faith, used them. They gave, and God met the supply as we saw there in, in uh, Philippians chapter 4. But my God shall supply. Start to click with me now. Amen. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in, in uh, whatever it says. Alright, so <laughs> the next thing is that uh, so uh, a preacher was supplied in many days. And, uh, uh, he, and by the way, when he, was, when he was supplied and continued to live, didn't die of starvation, he was therefore present for future needs in her life, which we're going to get to here in a minute. He hung around, and by the way, here was the picture of these days, the Bible says, and this will come out if you read this, we're not going to take time to read it this afternoon because you're tired and sleeping. But uh, what happened was, uh, uh, the, the way that, that, that he was he was living with them, but not with them, and it would be typical in that day to have a uh, set of stairs that went out that was outside on the side of the house and went up to a roof, and that would be up there what they would call the loft, and they would have a room up there, and uh, and that's undoubtedly where Elijah lived, and so uh, there wasn't even the hint of anything immoral happening there. But because of what she did, he was present there on the scene when she had another need that was yet to come. And so um, we see then number two, that some of the other results was that she, the giver, was sustained. Uh, she and her house did eat many days, according to verse 15, many days, until the days that the rain came and the crops began to grow again. And uh, we don't know if she had a house at least, but that must have been big enough that she could have guests in it. So we don't know what uh, it might have been like that her husband was alive. She may have been wealthy. We don't know. She may have had land, but of course in a drought, even the land isn't going to grow anything. But until that day that the rains came, uh, she, she did eat, she and her husband did eat 
But then B, we see her sons uh, resurrected. In verse 17, uh, chapter 17, and uh, 17 through 23. And uh, we're, uh, we're not going to read that, but what happens is her son gets sick. He's so sick that his breath leaves him. I believe he dies. And she calls Elijah and says, O oh, thou man of God, and in, verse, in the middle of verse 18, Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. He took, her out of his, out of her, took him out of her bosom, carried him up into the loft where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed. You remember the story then, that his soul comes back into him. And I want you to see her, her response to her receiving her son again. Verse 24, And the woman said unto Elijah, now, by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. And I put this down here. I want you to fill in this last blank. That the son's resurrection was proof absolute, or proof positive, of God's being involved in this. And I want you to think with me to the resurrection, to, to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The pastor mentioned this morning as he thinks about, about Christ and the cross and all that he bore upon the cross. And that when he died, yes, he died, dead, hello. He, uh, he didn't just swoon or faint or pass out or something. He died. Amen. And they took him down off the cross and Joseph of Arimathea and, and uh, um, uh, the other guy, I can't remember his name. Now, Nicodemus, they came and they get the body of Jesus down off the cross. They put it into Joseph's tomb. And they think that that's the end of it. They roll the rock in front of it, the big flat stone. They seal it up. The soldiers are there to make sure the disciples don't come and steal it. And lo and behold, three, three days later, he's resurrected. And we say, you know, at Easter time, we, 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 we believe in the resurrection so much so that it is part of the gospel. Hello. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The resurrection of Christ is absolutely necessary to us being saved. But here's the point. That his, resurre his resurrection from the grave proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was the Son of God and he had paid for the sins of mankind. Amen. Absolute proof. Amen. And so here what we see is a picture of that, really, because this, the, the Son dying here is, uh, it is absolute proof. This woman knows now, beyond notice, verse 24 doesn't occur anywhere else in this chapter, anywhere else in this story, anywhere else in the dealing of, of her. But now, she says, I know. Why? Because of the resurrection of the Son. And you and I can take that to the bank, ladies and gentlemen, because of the resurrection of the Son of God. We know absolutely for certain that we're saved and on our way to heaven. Amen. And I want you to know something today. Because of the resurrection of the Son, He has earned my respect. He saved me, and He's earned my respect, respect to the point that I want to be involved in what He's doing. Did you know that when we give to Faith Promise Missions, now listen to this. We actually become a partner of God in what He's doing. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that you'll find in the New Testament, especially uh, well, Acts chapter 11. Okay, I hadn't planned to say this, but I'll just throw it on top. Just peanuts on the ice cream. Okay, uh, Acts chapter 11 is the story of Cornelius. And we're not going to preach all of that, but I just want to point something out to you. And Cornelius has got a lot going for him. He's a good man. He, he cares about people, but he didn't say it. And he gets this heavenly visitor. An angel comes and says to him, I want you to send men to Joppa, and you'll find his inquirer for Simon. Uh, and he's uh, living over there with another guy by the name of Simon. And you uh, and, and, and call him over here, and he'll come and tell you what you have to do to get saved. Did you ever wonder why? That God didn't give Cornelius the gospel right there? Or why didn't God send an angel right there, an angel give the gospel to Cornelius? And the answer is, ladies and gentlemen, that God refused, now listen carefully, God refuses to do what He has given us to do. And when He said, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that means that, means that God isn't going to do it. We have to do it. And when the missionaries come through these doors and the missionaries that are your acquaintance and you want to support them and you begin to support them, what you're doing is you're saying to them, we can't go to Africa. I can't go to South America. 
But we as a church have the commandment or commission of God to reach those people. We have to do it. You say, well, what about all the other Baptist churches, independent Baptist churches around the world? Don't they have to do something too? Yeah, they've got the same commission we do. Amen. Mm -hmm. But we have to make an effort to reach the world. And listen to me. God isn't going to do what He has given us the job to do. And so since I can't go to Africa, I might be able to go to Anubit, the Northwest Territory, Nunavut, and, and so on and so forth. But I can't go to Africa. I can't go to South America. I can't go to Asia. But I can help send a missionary. And so what God has given me to do, listen, this is how I can be involved. And this is how you can be involved in what God is doing. And the blessedness of all of this is, the icing on the cake is, God says, if you do this, I'll look after you. Amen. That's the long and the short of this, of this whole message. You do what I tell you. If you just went and did, the promise of God is, I'll look after you. And what do we see in the New Testament? We see the same thing, don't we, from the book of Philippians. But my God shall supply all you. Why? Because they gave first, and then God met the need that their giving created. You following me now? Amen. Now, if we are, and by the way, we are wealthy compared to a lot of the world. You might think, well, I'm not wealthy, for if you don't understand my situation, I'm on a fixed income and there just isn't enough to make it to make it happen. Well, explain that to the Philippians when we get to heaven. Hmm? And uh, let's just think about this, that there of, of the great privilege that we have of being involved in what God would have partnering, literally partnering with the God of creation. Can you imagine that? He says, this is what I want you to do. My, 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 what a blessed thing to be involved with God in the great work of world evangelism. Well, the Bible illustration of the faith promise principle becomes especially vivid when we consider that God did this in a time of terrible drought with a woman who was especially vulnerable. This also shows that God does not promise us earthly wealth if we give by faith permissions it does, but it does promise that he will meet our needs, Philippians 4.19. By being involved in this program, we partner with God in the great work of reaching the world with the gospel. Now listen, the Bible says in the book of Luke, it says that in Luke chapter 4, it says that in, in those days, there were, in that time, there were many widows in Israel. But Elijah wasn't sent to any of them. He was sent to this woman who obviously, in God's foreknowledge, knew was going to respond mm -hmm. and get involved in this and look after the man of God. We need to look after the men and the women of God that carry the gospel. They're doing it for us. You say, well, the missionary needs us. That's true. But we need them too. Amen. Yeah. And Amen. so uh, let's get involved in this. Let's, let's be obedient. Let's do what God wants us to do. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you today for your goodness. Thank you for the clarity of the scriptures and how Father it just meets our needs one after the other. And it teaches us so much about how what you love. Help us, Father, to love what you love. Help us to love the soul of people in far off places that we'll never see in sight of heaven. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And then Pastor come in. I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to get take this glass of water and go over my seat. Amen. This is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while. Most of you have been involved in it for a while. And we have to decide if we're going to be faithful to what God's commanded us to do. It's your choice. I, I'm not, like he said, I'm not going to come around. I'm not going to browbeat anyone. Um, you either want blessings from God or you want to, like he said, look to flip in church and tell them, hey, I couldn't do it. Look at God and say, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't fulfill your great mission. It was too hard. I, for one, I, I want to be a part of God's work. And I've seen it time and time again. Like I said, I'm, I'm not to where he's at. But as I told you before, I pray one day God, God will 
allow us to get to the place where we exceed our tithe and continue to go. He's been doing this for a lot of years. Uh, I told you the story about the, the preacher who prayed that at the end of his life he was praying that God would allow him to keep 10% and give 90. God allowed him to do that. But there's always a place to start. A place to get involved. And I want to encourage you. Now, we've uh, hopefully by now who needs to fill out their card yet that are going to?